I've always wanted to be a member of the Singapore Red Cross Society ever since I was in primary school but unfortunately uh, the schools that I attended didn't have Red Cross units so it wasn't until I was in uh, NUS uh, one day I fell ill and I went to the University Health Service um, and uh, met Dr Patrick Tan at that time he was recruiting for the Voluntary Aid uh, Detachments Division or VAD for short and uh, that's how I got started. Um, okay, so I started out as a district development officer in uh, Red Cross Youth, um, which means I went down to the schools um, to teach them casualty evacuation, uh, foot drill, that kind of thing, and uh, Red Cross knowledge, of course. Um, then eventually I went on to more strategic roles like um, resource development uh, and then eventually ended up as a deputy director of Red Cross Youth uh, in charge of resources. Um, I had an ex-colleague, Sahari, who uh, was working in the Red Cross then and invited me for lunch. And after lunch, he escorted me promptly for a blood donation. There's no such thing as a free lunch. That's how it got started. And I signed up as a volunteer and it's never been stopping because there are so many things to do, so many missions to get on to. Um, and I'm still on it today. This was uh, interesting in a way because uh, I remember distinctly that I was actually on leave during that period um, when the tsunami happened and then uh, I was attending or rather I was helping my friend to coordinate her wedding and when the tsunami hit and then uh, I remembered cancelling my leave and going back to Red Cross to do work. So at that point in time I was actually a staff of the Singapore Red Cross. Um, so for that one month or so, um, we were, you know, busy working till wee hours of the morning and then going back to sleep for a while and then coming back to work again. Um, eventually, I think sometime in February uh, 2005, I went uh, to Mulabo itself. Uh, at that point in time, they were still clearing maybe about 19 dead bodies a day. Um, despite the tsunami having been over for a um, couple of months, but, but uh, that was what struck me. We, went, we did get to go to Ground Zero uh, to have a look at uh, the, the destruction um, you know, caused by the tsunami. And uh, what really struck me then as well as uh, even now um, when disasters happen is the resilience of the people who are affected by these disasters. We need to talk a little bit about the civil-military relationship, uh, or CMR for short. Um, so in January 2005, after the tsunami, um, we collaborated with a few uh, government aid agencies as well as uh, non-governmental organisations uh, to send a landing ship tank, or LST, um, LST Endeavour to Mulabo with 40 volunteers uh, on board and these 40 were made up of um, eight Singapore Red Cross volunteers as well as uh, volunteers from other uh, VWOs such as uh, Touch Community Services, NVPC, um, YMCA um, and there were only, if I recall, two women on board, one of which was our Singapore Red Cross volunteer and she was the mission leader for that trip. Well, this, I mean, the eight uh, workers who were transported by sea, I mean, we, they were supplemented by the advance team that was on. We went instead by a three-in-one uh, approach. We took off from Paliba on the Charlie 130, landed in Medan, took off the next day uh, on a Chinook and landed in Milabo. We made our trip back by the same LST. It was a very unusual deployment in the sense that mm. every day we work onshore in Milabo and in the evening we you get sent on board LST. to LST and uh, sleep over. Yeah. Um, the Red Cross relationship with uh, the military is a uh, unique one in the sense that they were the only ones who could get us in. We do not normally associate ourselves uh, with the military. But in this case, uh, we are forever indebted to the Navy for offering accommodation, the Air Force for the transfer. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. 
And, and it was um, difficult deployment, I, I felt. Um, I wasn't there on, on the ground, but I was working in the Singapore Red Cross at that time. Um, it was difficult because, uh, like what Chu said, at night they go on board the LST. So on, on, in the daytime, they were deployed out to, uh, using a fast craft, right? Um, they were deployed out from the LST to Ground Zero in Mulabo. And we lost connectivity with them uh, during the day because there's just no telecoms available. Uh, it's totally been wiped out by, by the tsunami. So I could only get in touch with the team, the mission leader, at 11 p.m. at night, which is why uh, when, when they were back um, on the LST, which is why I said during that um, one month of operations, uh, we had to work until maybe 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, then go back to sleep, e even in Singapore, you know, go back to sleep and then uh, come back the next day at 5 a.m. to start work again. Um, it was challenging, but I think um, it also showed the, the resilience and, and the goodness of uh, people who, who come forward to want to help in, in such instances. I, I think that communication uh, is an interesting angle. There was no WhatsApp then. Mm. So there was uh, SMS. And Couldn't get through. Because of the limited capacity to handle all the communications uh, on ground in Milabo, all the SMSs uh, came in after midnight. So mm. I would have like 80, 90, 100 SMS uh, every evening, to, every night to deal with. And I'll probably get them sorted out by 2 in the morning. Mm. And then we'll be off again at daybreak um, mm. on the shore. In January 2005, when we first arrived in Milabo, I was stationed at the hospital with the, again, advanced team. And sometime in late morning, a very young uh, boy was brought into the hospital with uh, breathing difficulties. There was nothing much we could do. I attempted to negotiate for a helicopter transfer to Maidan. That didn't happen. He died shortly after, and I went to see him. And his eyes were open. I thought it was okay, I mean, for me to deal with it. And it was. But six months later, after I returned home, when I turned on the water and showers, I had a real flashback of him. It stayed with me every day for five years. I tried to make sense of it, and I think I did. I found meaning in that experience. I did my advanced degree and I did my dissertation on uh, flashbacks and post-traumatic stress disorder on the part of relief workers. It's not with me anymore today, but I won't forget him. I won't forget Milabo and what we did to help the local population. A group of us went to um, Jogja in 2010 because Mount Merapi, which is an active volcano, was threatening to erupt. So one fine morning at about um, maybe five plus in the morning, I was really woken up, um, shaken literally out of bed. And so I sat up, I sat up on the bed and I looked at my um, roommate and said, Don, why are you shaking the bed so violently? And then she sat up and then she looked at me and said, Doreen, why are you shaking the bed so violently? Then the two of us looked at each other and went, oh, sharks, earthquake. So then the two of us ran out <laughs> in our pyjamas and sleepwear out, out of the hotel room and that's how we knew um, you know, that there's been an earthquake. And um, in that one day, we set up a field hospital uh, in, in Bantu um, and, and we saw about 1,500 to 2,000 patients in that one day. Um, so when we deployed out um, after we were all, you know, woken up and uh, freshened up, um, we were staying in the same hotel as the Indonesian Red Cross or uh, PMI for short. Um, we were the only vehicle going into uh, the disaster area, whereas the rest of the world was going the opposite direction. So we were like, are we going in the correct direction? Um, but eventually, as we set up the hospital, along the way, we had to set up um, like makeshift first aid posts because there were just so many casualties coming in. I vividly remember that uh, one of my one of my teammates actually um, had to stop traffic along the way uh, to help a uh, uh, lorry, uh, a pickup truck that was conveying casualties. Um, 
because that truck had actually run out of patrol, so we had to push the truck to a makeshift first aid base. Um, there were just so many casualties and um, in the end, on the first day, we had about uh, 11 Singaporeans because we, we met up with a Mercy Relief that was um, you know, on the ground as well. Uh, and we, so we became Team Singapore. So there were about 11 Singaporeans and about 40 uh, PMI volunteers. And we were the ones who actually first set up the field hospital. In 2013, we responded to the Bohol earthquake. We made way to Luan Hospital, which was on the coast. Again, I was with the advanced team to find out what their needs were and how subsequent teams can uh, help the local population. But it's always about expecting the unexpected. In, during the evening, there was a lady who came in with uh, breathing difficulty. And it was a real emergency because uh, the roads were actually cut off. I was with two uh, Singapore Red Cross uh, volunteer doctors and they asked me if we could get a helicopter. The answer, of course, is uh, no. We attempted to do what we could with the local doctor. The equipment uh, failed. There was no light. It's a good thing I have a flashlight, which I make every volunteer carry on mission uh, today. Um, we did manage uh, the three doctors, as in, successfully intubate uh, the patient. But making way by road, which was uh, disrupted, in the first place uh, was difficult in the middle of the night. And added to that was the fact that uh, the oxygen tank ran, ran out of oxygen. We then uh, made plans for the destination hospital, Red Cross Ambulance, to send uh, oxygen to us while we look for a local uh, clinic with uh, oxygen. It all happened at the same time. The lady was uh, successfully uh, evacuated. The doctors met her in the morning. She was still alive. And I'm glad we made that difference, although we were actually on the advanced team. So I remember being called by Sahari uh, just a, f a day or two after the Typhoon Haiyan struck Philippines. And um, together with uh, Sahari himself, Chu, as well as another volunteer, we set out um, as the advanced team to or mock. Uh, to, to you know, do a needs assessment on the ground? I think it was a very stressful uh, mission because mm. uh, it came shortly after the Bohol earthquake mission. So in between, we had maybe a week of rest. And considering that both of us have full-time jobs and yet can still go on mission at any time, at, in this case, maybe less than a day's notice, it was quite incredible. Um, we, we landed in Cebu, made our way to Amok by ferry. And I mean, as a staging base, there was just so much uh, logistics going on. Yeah. So the uh, main job of the uh, advanced team actually was to identify uh, what were the areas that we could help in, uh, what were the ingress and egress routes, what are the resources that we can tap on, um, and who we can link up with on the ground. Um, and I think. Like Chu said, it was a very stressful few days because uh, we really had very little sleep. Um, and I think, but at the end of the day, uh, I think what kept us going was the you know, thought that we are making that little bit of difference um, to, to the lives of these villages. And if I may add, um, what we do as an advanced team uh, turns, starts the engine for aid to continue. I think uh, the Red Cross was involved in redevelopment mm. and other initiatives and programs that went on for years. Mm. Uh, I think it's a good five years after the disaster that um, the reconstruction, everything was uh, finally completed. Yeah, that's right. I remember uh, leading a group of students, uh, cadets, as well as uh, volunteer instructors from Red Cross Youth, together with uh, two teacher officers and uh, a fellow other of officer um, to bring these cadets and VIs to Ormok to teach um, hand hygiene, um, to teach English, uh, to finish the construction of sanitation facilities in schools. So I think um, the Red Cross actually did quite some good work in, in Ormok and uh, in the areas affected by Typhoon Haiyan. 
and if I again may add the advanced team, right? Um, although has a very short time um, on ground, it's extremely stressful because of the lack of sleep. We end our work normally past midnight, and we could be off again at three or four in the morning. Um, so sometime last year, around uh, maybe September, October, the head of Singapore Red Cross uh, Copcoms and Marketing, Eileen, actually approached me and asked uh, if I was available and interested in uh, going back to some of the areas affected by Typhoon Haiyan to see how uh, the contributions by Singapore Red Cross as well as the people of Singapore have uh, changed the lives or, or turned around um, uh, any, anything in, in these areas. And uh, so I gamely sought permission from my employer and uh, off I went with a couple of uh, staff from Singapore Red Cross. Um, I think it was an eye-opening experience for me because all along for the last um, two trips that I've made, regarding Typhoon Haiyan have always been at Ormok and uh, and this time round we went somewhere else. We had a look at you know a place where we donated um, where we donated an ambulance, a land ambulance as well uh, as a village where we donated a sea ambulance and I heard first-hand stories of uh, the beneficiaries like so so like for, for example there was this lady who said um, she was grateful for the land ambulance because one day uh, she, she was in labour, she was pregnant and she, wa she went into labour and because the village that she stayed in didn't have a uh, hospital equipped with facilities uh, for her delivery so they had to use the, the land ambulance to transfer her to another hospital um, but along the way she went really into you know serious labour and uh, she gave birth in the ambulance so 20 minutes into the journey to the hospital, they had to turn back because she, she gave birth in the ambulance. I thought that was quite meaningful. Yeah. I think we always read about news uh, of disasters, but the Red Cross uh, gives me that unique opportunity to attend to the, well, I mean, the most memorable one would have to be the Boxing Day tsunami. Um, I don't think that there would have been another way for me to make a difference to some people. Um, that's uh, unforgettable. You know, you're actually quite jinxed. Every mission that I've been on with you has been like extremely exciting because your expect the unexpected uh, is really unexpected, you know? It is no, no laughing matter. Even in Singapore, when I served with uh, the first aiders on wheel in Pulau Ubin not so long ago, there was one morning when a tourist uh, presented himself at the first aid post and he had all the signs of uh, a heart attack. And of course, like Pulau Ubin, I mean, what could we do? Uh, no, there's no helicopter. We had to get the police launch to help evacuate uh, the patient across. Uh, I'm, I was so fearful uh, for one reason, because there was only one first aider, me on board the police uh, fast craft. Done. Yep. And yep, uh, everything's good. And uh, I hear that he's okay. It's been many years, a couple of decades. Um, along the way, I met, made many friends. He's one of them. Um, and honestly, honestly, the, it's, it's more the thought that, you know, I can make that little bit of difference in people's lives. That's maybe, that's what kept me going all these years. Um, I've been on, on uh, quite a few overseas relief and uh, developmental uh, missions. And I guess the most rewarding for me is, uh, you know, looking in the faces of the beneficiaries and seeing their smiles, the, the smiles on their faces. 70th anniversary message. I think I would like to share uh, something that was said to me by our former Secretary General, Mrs. Jerry Lau. Um, she said, let's always serve humanity and bring hope to the lives of those we serve. I thought that was really meaningful and it stuck with me all these years. I, I think humanity is the first fundamental principle of the Red Cross mm -hmm. and it again presents a unique opportunity for volunteers to make a difference uh, every day. Mm. Uh, the legacy of 70 years I believe is only a beginning as volunteers we look for a sense of belonging purpose 
transcendence and of course a personal narrative which is what we are doing now. Yeah, yeah. and we are grateful. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think um, Red Cross has given me opportunities that uh, I don't think I'll be able to get anywhere else and for that I'm truly grateful um, for the opportunity to make that difference 